At this point, I'm going to take the opportunity to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Renata Talarico from the United Nations Populations Fund. Before I do that, please do remember that when you're tweeting about this event, don't forget to use the hashtag, hashtag M2M Digital Health. Renata, Dr. Renata Talarico holds a PhD from Italy on international and European law with a focus on human rights law, a master's degree in international relations and a certificate in international health and women's rights from Stanford University. She has more than 12 years experience working on sexual and reproductive health rights. She joined UNFPA in 2009, serving as HIV prevention officer in the kingdom of Eswatini. She currently works for UNFPA East and Southern Africa Regional Office as a youth team lead and regional coordinator for a program implemented in 12 countries in East and Southern Africa, focusing on adolescence, sexual and reproductive health and rights. Prior to joining UNFPA, she worked in various positions in academia and civil society organizations in Italy and beyond. Renata is a passionate advocate for the realization of the sexual and reproductive rights of all people with particular interest in adolescent and young people's rights. Over to you, Renata, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Shomi, for such a kind introduction. Um, it is a pleasure for me to be here today um, all protocol of self. Um, good afternoon to you all from Johannesburg. First of all, let me convey warm greetings from my Deputy Regional Director, Ms. Beatrice Mutali, who unfortunately, due to a last minute urgent commitment, is not able to be here today. However, it is my pleasure to join you for this important discussion, which really places a spotlight on the role of digital health in achieving universal health coverage in Africa. Some of you may know that at UNFPA, the United Nations Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency, our mission is to deliver a world where every pregnancy is wanted, every child is safe, and every young person's potential is fulfilled. What is clear to us is that our mission cannot be accomplished without realizing universal access to sexual reproductive health rights. We also recognize that technology and digital tools can play an essential role in accelerating progress towards universal health coverage. Let's for a moment celebrate the successes achieved since the International Conference on Population and Development held in Cairo. We often start with what still needs to be done, but it's, it's, it's great to also appreciate where we come from and how much progress we've made so far. So today, one in three women uses a modern family planning method compared to less than one in 10 in 1994. A woman's risk of dying in pregnancy and childbirth has dropped by 38% since 2000. Many countries have criminalized gender-based violence and have outlawed child marriage and fem female genital mutilation. And what is very relevant for this region is that in Asia, uh, Eastern Southern Africa, new HIV infections have declined, declined by 43% between 2010 and 2020. And there are 50% fewer AIDS-related deaths in that same time frame. These gains, however, as Frank was saying earlier, have been impacted significantly by COVID-19 pandemic, with the deepest impact on groups experiencing intersecting forms of inequality. These include people living in poverty, those working in informal employment settings, women, girls, persons with disabilities, migrants, and older persons, to mention a few. To say more, the pandemic has significantly altered the national planning, service delivery, and health financing landscape, in particular, financing of sexual reproductive health services. People's health seeking behavior have also changed significantly due to COVID-19. All those shifts, therefore, require rapid scale up of proven innovative solutions, including the utilization of digital technology. With the rapid development in technology and the disruption of the healthcare delivery by COVID-19, digitalization has become a key component in transforming the healthcare terrain. However, even before COVID-19 happened, the Africa Health Strategy, which was endorsed in 2016, had already made one of its key objectives to strengthen health research, innovation, ICTs for health, technological capabilities and developing sustainable evidence-informed solutions for Africa's health challenges. Thereafter, in 2020, the Digital Transformation Strategy for Africa, 
which was um, uh, launched in, in March 2020, further elaborated on the provision highlighted in the Africa Health Strategy and specifically focused its recommendations on the inevitable need to invest in digital health to truly achieve universal health coverage in the continent. So it is clear, Africa needs digital health to achieve UHC. This is, this is not disputable. Now the focus, and I know you will discuss that extensively in the following session, is how. So let me share with you briefly a few real life examples of how digital technology is advancing human rights for women and girls and improving their health, in particular, their sexual reproductive health in Eastern Southern Africa. A first example is the use of digital platforms to scale, at scale to improve the knowledge of frontline health workers. We have established, for instance, a joint UN virtual learning platform for midwives in the region. Secondly, UNFPA is supporting extensive use of digital, digital technology to ensure last mile delivery of essential life-saving uh, sexual reproductive health products. This initiative fills a crucial uh, gap in improving the efficiency of health service delivery systems and strengthens the primary healthcare system broadly. A third example is the use of digital platform to enhance self-care, to generate self-awareness, to facilitate self-screening and self-management as several countries in the Asia region have done. For example, in Mozambique, a UNFPA supported initiative uses artificial intelligence and big data to connect pregnant women to transportation services during emergencies. Expectant mothers are also connected remotely to health professionals during travel to health facilities, reducing the effects of delays to obstetric care. Colleagues and friends, while there has been progress on digital health in Africa, substantial barriers remain because the foundation elements have not been adequately addressed. Barriers to scaling up of digital health interventions include weak infrastructure and device access, including reliable electricity and affordable high-speed broadband connectivity, especially in rural areas. A lack of sufficient and consistent funding for digital health programs and also limited human resource capacity and digital skills. As we jointly work on the challenges, we must also press forward. In the ASA region, we are ready to scale up our current initiatives. We will continue to enhance the skills of frontline health workers, ensure last mile availability of essential health products and improve the readiness of places of care. Additionally, we will ensure that digital services have inbuilt real-time feedback mechanisms for users. Such information will help to improve the quality of care and satisfaction, the expansion of, of self-care as well. In this regard, we have a window of opportunity that we should never forget. Adolescents and young people are our opportunity in this continent. The ones who are accessing the digital technology tools and internet at a much earlier stage in life. As I conclude, let me just add one final statement. Investing in technologies is lifelong commitment and not a once-off intervention. It requires continued financing, tech improvements, and client satisfaction assessments. Please do, not, please do have this in mind as you proceed with your discussions today to ensure that we build on the opportunity of digital health in a sustainable manner. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Talarico. Such inspiring words there. And also just focusing us, um, especially today. Um, as you said, Africa needs digital health to achieve universal health coverage. And, um, you know, already um, people are asking, you know, we really like to have access to that digital transformation for Africa strategy so that we get to understand what's happening in the context of Africa. Um, so really, really great points there. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and to all the speakers of the opening session um, remarkable hi again everybody it seems like we may still be having um connectivity issues um where shumbi is joining us from today in um gaborone um so i will take the microphone back and just finish shumbi's vote of thanks to our speakers um in the opening session who of course were dr renata talarico um will boda awur akuro and Frank Beadle de Palomo, um, uh, Mothers to Mothers President and CEO. Um, opening sessions are always wonderful. 
And it's also always wonderful to get into the meat of um, the conversations and events such as this. And this next session um, is definitely uh, the meat. Um, it is going to be hosted by my amazing colleague, Nakulu Lombe Kwendeni. Um, Nakulu, as we call her, is um, M2M Senior Technical Advisor for Reproductive Maternal Newborn and Child Health, or RMNCH. She has wide ranging experience in supporting the implementation and management of HIV and PMTCT programs across Sub Saharan Africa. Before joining Mothers to Mothers, Nakulu worked in adult and pediatric HIV management, malaria, and nutrition programs at the Clinton Health Access Initiative, also known as CHAI. In her current role, she leads Mothers to Mothers' RMNCAH portfolio, including innovation, technical support, and capacity building to M2M's RMNCH PMTCT work across all countries. And of course, this has included um, helping to design and embed digital health innovations, never more so than in the last couple of years, Nakulu. Um, Nakulu also holds a master's in public health from the University of Leeds, and she says she is truly passionate about using digital health solutions to improve service delivery and achieve healthcare for all. Nakulu, over to you for this very exciting, exciting lightning presentation um, session. Thank you, Dylan, for your kind introduction. To all the speakers in the open plenary for sharing their insights to help us frame the day. We're going to move to one of the most exciting sessions of the day. And in this session, we may be joined by a guest of honor, the Honorable Dr. Jane Ruth Aseng Osero, the Minister of Health of the Republic of Uganda, and depending on her schedule, we expect the Honorable Minister to join us at about 3 p.m. Central African time, around 30 minutes from now, for a 10-minute intervention. The remainder of the session is brief presentations from three organizations at the cutting edge of blending digital and in-person services to deliver universal health coverage. I'll introduce each speaker more fully, but joining us are Lupile Kachila, from Village Reach, Rich Bryson from Reach 52, and Marjorie Mbule from Mothers to Mothers. Each of these speakers will present for 10 to 15 minutes on their work, and will save questions and discussions for the end of the session. Please feel free to raise your hand or submit questions through the Q&A function as we go along. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Upile Kachila, as a senior program manager and solution owner for Health Center by Phone for the organization Village Reach. Upile is responsible for the overall implementation and transition of Chipatala Chapa Phoni, CCPF, to Malawi's Ministry of Health um, and Population. CCPF is a toll free health hotline in Malawi that creates a link between health center and remote communities. The hotline is staffed by trained health workers who provide information and referrals over the phone on all health and nutrition related topics. For two years, Upile was a technical advisor seconded to the Ministry of Health and Population. She worked with key staff to strengthen both technical and administrative support for the hotline and supported the national scale up and community mobilization plans. She also leads exploration efforts for the health by health center by phones replication in other countries. Prior to her role with Village Reach, Upile worked for Population Services International as a project coordinator for the Social Franchise Project. She holds a Master's of Science in Global Challenges from the University of Edinburgh, specializing in global health, environment, and development. Upile, over to you. Thank you very much, Nakulu. Um, your Excellencies, all protocols observed. Um, it is with great pleasure that I am here today to share with you the works that we have done as Village Reach in um, strengthening, you know, healthcare systems by use of innovation and the innovation that we call the health center by phone. So I'll be presenting on this innovation that has proven impactful in strengthening service delivery approaches through the increase um, in access to quality, accurate, as well as reliable health information and advice. So to begin with, um, the health center by phone is a combination of the hotline, uh, pre-recorded platform, messages platform, as well as a WhatsApp 
chatbot messaging service. And the users are community members, parents, as well as health workers that call in to get access to the information that is available on this platform. The services offered are firstly the hotline itself, which includes speaking to a trained hotline worker. And these are nurses for Malawi, but in other places, we also have community health workers that get to man the hotline. And then we have the pre-recorded messages where we use interactive voice recordings on different health topics that are frequently asked about, for instance, maternal and child health, or be it nutrition, COVID-19, sexual reproductive health, and so many other health areas. And then as for the chat function, which uses WhatsApp to create a two-way chat conversation, this has an inbuilt artificial intelligence aspect so that you know, one to two hotline workers can answer questions coming in from the whole country. And this has been the case um, in South Africa, for instance. So in thinking through, you know, the work that is done by, by health workers, especially those at the front lines um, when it comes to delivering primary health care, especially in the rural communities, we believe that if we had these health workers empowered, then we could disseminate information around COVID-19 and beyond. We could quickly penetrate um, the communities with accurate information about how, for instance, the virus spreads, how to protect the community and make sure that the healthcare workers themselves stay protected as they discharge their services. So contrary to um, the previous outbreaks or epidemics that allowed for in-person trainings um, with COVID-19 restrictions, there was need for a solution that would allow for distance learning in order to ensure that capacities were being built um, in a rapid manner to um, avoid any service disruptions there. So this then prompted us to deploy a mobile-based solution that uses voice recorded messages to disseminate guidelines and protocols about COVID-19 to health workers. And we had to develop the content that was used um, on this platform in close collaboration with the Ministry of Health. It is important at this point, however, that um, there's need to understand that this particular exercise had never been done before in all the three countries that Village Rich operates in. And there had never been a push of information to health workers, as well as no national database that kept contact lists for health workers across countries. So in coming up with this solution, um, we wanted to reach at least 32,000 health workers across all the three core countries that we currently work in. And of course, as we were rolling out this initiative, um, there were some successes as well as challenges that we encountered and you know, we were able to then draw a lot of learnings from that experience. So to tackle the successes that we were able to register, for instance, um, we did realize that there was strong government buy-in to begin with and a lot of interest as well as commitment in seeing how the remote learning aspect would evolve and ultimately lead to strengthened capacities for frontline workers. And then, with the way the, 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 the learning initiative is programmed, there was not any need for literacy in order for one to participate um, in the you know, training exercise. And to make it even more easy, the lessons were available in multiple languages and were disseminated in a way that was easy to use and comprehend. The learning itself could reach any type of um, um, phone that a user was using. So there wasn't any need for one to own a smartphone, for instance, in order for them to participate. So long as they were connected to a reliable network and they had access to even the most basic of phones, participants were able to retrieve the training content and participate favorably. 
The platform also incorporated quiz questions so that we could ascertain whether or not good learning you know, was indeed taking place. So in thinking through um, the way forward, um, you know, bearing in mind that when we're launching some new and innovative um, um, solutions, challenges are definitely going to be registered. So for instance, when we did our midpoint evaluations, we learned that people were not calling back when they, for instance, missed the call from the system. Um, mainly because of the cost aspect that was attributed to making that outgoing call. So this prompted us to negotiate for um, you know, some way of zero rating the outgoing calls initiated by participants so that they could ably call back the system to retrieve them, you know, the, the, the content that they otherwise would have missed. So we saw that having this agreement in place with the mobile network operators enabled participation to improve, but also it gave participants an opportunity to access you know, the training content at any time of their convenience. Also in you know, gathering evidence um, pertaining to how the training was conducted, in one of the feedback sessions um, we got from the evaluation that um, you know, the speakers in the voice record recording spoke a bit too quickly, which made it very hard for listeners to follow through, but also comprehend as to what the content was talking about. So that's something that um, we would heavily recommend changing in future so that at least the way um, the content is recorded is in a way that is easy for any user to comprehend. And then when thinking through what the overall you know, digital health solution that we're discussing today looks like um, holistically, the solution will continue to address the needs of caregivers as well as health workers seeking personalized information and support about their health as well as their work. The platform further empowers clients or users to self-report and provide feedback on their health facility experience through the help desk that is built into the system. And we believe that having this available provides an extra layer of um, you know, uh, monitoring too for decision makers within departments of health to monitor aspects of service delivery and thereby foster some great responses that could then lead into improvements as well as efficiencies. And then from the data that we collect, um, there is the aspect of data visibility as well as data analytics. And we believe that having this in place would help departments of health um, kind of use that information to better track follow up, for instance, as well as act upon any feedback um, that they receive that speaks to the overall quality of, of the service. And then infusing in the artificial intelligence aspect, um, we do realize that AI can identify you know, high volumes of disease incidences based on incoming messages, which would then indicate possible potential outbreak locations and thereby guide uh, rapid deployment efforts that different ministries of health would devise in response to those possible outbreak um, as indicated in the data that comes through the system. And then, Aside from COVID, looking at how the current digital revolution has brought about so many opportunities in the digital health space, there are so many improvements as well as overall quality um, effectiveness as well as service provision efficiencies that we do, that we do see um, being realized through the use and integration of digital platforms. For instance, when we look at um, the remote learning aspect, here, based on the performance that we've had, we would want to still add some additional modules and content and have this integrated um, into the government's training programs. And for, Mal for Malawi, for instance, the government has shown interest in making this a component of their curriculum, as well as for continuous professional development. And then, of course, 
when we look more holistically beyond COVID-19, there presents a lot of immense opportunities that can be tapped into that could help further strengthen the health center by phone solution um, and its overall programming. In Malawi, for example, we are already using the solution as a social listening platform where, for instance, we tap into the data that comes in and analyze on behavior, social, as well as structural drivers of vaccination uptake to inform evidence-based programming, as well as planning. And just to say that this goes beyond COVID-19, this too can also be used for other immunization programs um, that you know, are, undertaking, are undertaken in a country or even any other health-related campaigns that might rise up based on need. It is also um, good to realize that the solution presents an opportunity where um, you know, the insights that are gathered from the engagements with clients could potentially point to possible negative effects on service disruptions or system shocks, or even any vaccine related events. And now looking beyond more holistically, it is certain that there are so many potentials within the digital health space and untapped opportunities to further strengthen governments and health systems, as well as build the capacity of healthcare workers at the same time, empower communities with accurate health information at their fingertips so that they can begin to act steadfastly on all aspects of their health in a way that is informed um, with the availability of information. So let me stop here for now. Thank you so, so much for your attention. Upile, thanks so much for that fascinating presentation, your discussion on successes and challenges um, in remote learning is great to hear from you. And also your recommendations on digital health moving forward beyond the pandemic. So it's great uh, work and thank you for your presentation. I'm now pleased to introduce Rich Bryson, Chief uh, Strategic and Marketing Officer at REACH52. REACH52 is a company focused on using technology to strengthen health systems and expand access to healthcare in low and middle income countries. Rich has many years of experience in strategy, design, and implementation of health system strengthening, access to medicine programs, and public private sector partnerships across lo low and middle income nations. Prior to joining REACH 52, Rich was a life science lead at the global consulting business Accenture. Rich, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gilly. And it's great to uh, be, I'm just going to share my slides. There we go. Put it on full screen. There we go. Great to, great to be with everyone. And it's a fantastic event among, amongst such esteemed speakers and experts from across the area. And as uh, Nikita says, I'm yeah, Rich Bryce, and I, I head up uh, strategy and programs and marketing at Reach 52. And we're a, a tech social enterprise delivering health services into communities across low American countries, enabled by our health tech platform and networks of community teams. And today I'm going to talk to you about three key things. The first of those is why digital health solutions, a lot of digital health solutions just don't work for billions of people living in low connectivity regions across the planet. Uh, secondly, what we need to do differently together in practice. And then thirdly, I'm going to be talking through our platform that is hopefully part of that solution and sharing some of the practical ways we've implemented that across the communities where we work and really trying to bring to life some of the real challenges on the ground and the way you can overcome those challenges to use digital health to accelerate health, health, uh, health access for all. So yeah, as I mentioned, to start off with, um, digital health has huge potential to accelerate universal health coverage. Uh, but despite all this fanfare that we've been getting during the, during the pandemic about digital health, too many solutions just don't work for billions of people living in low connectivity, low resource settings across low income countries. And these are the very people who most need access to 
to healthcare and to benefit from digital health services. Um, to give you an example of uh, someone from one of the communities we work with in, in the Philippines, in rural Philippines, Nalita. So Nalita is, uh, work, uh, lives in a rural area, a household income of three to seven dollars uh, income per day, um, long distances from, from health providers, and just lacks access to affordable medicines, uh, health workers, diagnostics, uh, screening services that, that she needs. And whilst clearly communities and countries differ, differ vastly, there are billions of people like Nalita in this situation in low resource settings. Um, according to WHO, over half the world still lacks access to essential health services. And so in terms of the change that's needed, we need to recognize some of these realities. Uh, the realities of people living in low resource settings like this. Uh, we need to recognize the reality that a lot of people still lack access to the internet. Uh, there's still 3 billion people, over 3 billion people offline in the world. So I think I saw a report the other day saying there's been 7.5%, over 7.5% growth of the internet this year. But actually, that's still leaving a huge amount of people who just don't have access to the internet who are, who are offline. And coupled with that, even if there is access to connectivity and the devices are there and be, being used, there's still huge issues around digital literacy that we're going to need to overcome. I often see, uh, we often see just a real uh, kind of assumptions made about digital literacy and an overestimation of it. And clearly it goes without saying you can't get digital health services working unless that comes hand in hand with really uh, improvements in the digital literacy of communities that need to use them. So in that context, uh, what needs to happen differently? Because uh, as I say, I'm a huge advocate, clearly, uh, in my experience, the work I do for digital health and the role it can play in universal health coverage. Um, but I, in my view, it needs, to, it needs to focus on three key things. And I, I frame them around the three C's because I find that kind of a neat way to, to kind of bring them together. But it's really about the practicalities underneath them that's most important. The first of these is ensuring that digital health services and solutions are community led. And that doesn't mean just engaging with communities. It means building the solutions with the communities so that they own the communities uh, they, and that they own the digital health services that they're trying to, they're trying to implement. Um, you know, we saw recently from a report uh, with some of our community health workers where we work were that actually over 50% have never used a mobile health application before. Um, so they don't need complicated solutions. What they're looking for is a simple user experience, um, services that work on very basic operating systems and practical support on the front line to do the job, um, not kind of heavy manuals and overcomplicated systems. So being really community led is important. And I think we see that in, you know, this big focus on telehealth. I'm sure like, like me, you've seen all the headlines around telehealth, you know, the growth of telehealth during this period. And it's almost assumed that that, that might be the solution. Well, actually, in a lot of cases, Voice services are a lot more preferred in our communities. Simple voice services um, actually address the needs of the communities better. So community-led is absolutely critical. Um, secondly, it's about connectivity. As I mentioned, there's a huge populations in the world are still offline. So we're going to need to find ways, going to long-term and shorter term, to accelerate the change there. And clearly policy is part of this. Uh, I think there's a role for government regulation, um, where we work, one of the countries we work in, in India, things like the um, fund that they set up um, to be able to work with telecoms companies to provide 5% of their revenues um, to that, expand access for fibre cables into rural areas can make a difference. Similarly, if we're trying to shift from paper-based systems to more digitised systems and electronic health records, there needs to be a, a greater focus on what's actually needed to do that on the ground. Um, we certainly hear, and this is, you know, maybe not the case everywhere, but we, we've heard it multiple times. Doctors are provided with the system, uh, but they, don't, they aren't provided with the training. They aren't provided with access to ways to get internet. They often don't have the power sources. Uh, they don't know the data standards they need to use. And so we've got to make sure that there's an integrated way to build that infrastructure into the communities. Uh, and, and then alongside that, and as I'll come on, to one of the ways that we're looking to address the problem is uh, through offline health technology. So equipping community health teams with offline health technology and services that they can use in offline areas 
um, deliver the services, capture the health data that's needed, and then sync when back online. So connectivity is the other key area. And then the third area is around, is around collaboration. Uh, it goes without saying this is, a, this is a huge challenge we're trying to address in terms of health and well-being for all. And it's going to require collaboration on an unprecedented scale. I mean, I think there's obviously a, a lot of really valuable, impactful partnerships across um, different players in the health system. But I think there needs to be this shift away from just about partnerships to platforms, platforms that bring together all the players, all the actors in the health system to deliver integrated solutions together and bringing together the best capabilities of everyone. And that requires, that requires new mindsets as much as new technologies to make happen. So uh, in terms of practically how we go about this, uh, very much reflecting these three Cs, we have built and are delivering an offline first health platform for low connectivity regions. And um, that's been predominantly in South and Southeast Asia, but we have recently launched into Kenya as well. Uh, and at the heart of it is uh, Reach52 uh, Reach Access, uh, which is an offline first platform that enables a full range of health services in low resource, low connectivity areas. So it supports e-learning uh, for health workers. It supports community health teams in delivering engagement and education for health programs and health conditions, delivering screening and referrals, and then also integrates with community agents that we equip to run e-commerce and logistics services for the last mile, working with partners and distributors to deliver affordable medicines, affordable health products and insurance uh, directly into the communities. And all of this is underpinned by the data we're, we're capturing and the insights that we're deriving to drive more targeted health programs and services. So that's fundamental to creating this, this connectivity. Um, but in line with my, my other Cs, we also then work and partner with the communities to be able to deliver it. So that's both working with uh, community NGOs, community health workers and community members to equip them with mobile apps, which link to the platform and different digital devices, uh, which work completely offline, link to the platform, integrate with the public health providers and different partners we bring together to run services. And then alongside that, in terms of collaboration, it, it's a platform. And so what we're looking to do and are doing is bring together different health system actors um, to collaborate and integrate solutions versus just doing reinventing the wheel and doing standalone programs. Um, and that's obviously involving public health providers and government. Um, we don't go and do it all ourselves. We equip existing community NGOs who are already in the communities with the technology, with the skill sets and our capabilities to be able to go and deliver the services. So that enables scale. And then working across a broad spectrum of different types of private sector organizations from farmer and consumer health organizations looking to design new services and enable access to their products through to the tech businesses um, to deliver things like health chatbots and services on low data versions of their platforms. So that's the, that's the platform and I thought, I'd also just give, give, a, give some learnings and some practical experiences of how we're, we're implementing that, this in our, in our country for a couple of different initiatives. The first of them is um, a, a collaboration with uh, Johnson Johnson, one of obviously the partners on today's, uh, on today's event with the public health providers in the Philippines um, to digitize frontline health workers um, across Southeast Asia, um, equipping them with uh, diagnostics, with capabilities and with our mobile platform to uh, address issues around non-communicable diseases, infectious diseases, including COVID-19, um, and address gaps in maternal and child health as well. And we've also, as part of this, to again, talking about the total collaboration solution, we've also uh, worked with Facebook and, and they've supported in terms of things like um, health chatbot services to help strengthen the system, address with some, some of the misinformation in the communities. And this has been very impactful in terms of equipping thousands of communities through did this digital platform. But I think there's the things I think we thought would be most useful to share is actually what were some of the key learnings about how you do it and, and what makes it work in practice. And the first of those is around um, this combination of mindset, skill sets and diagnostics, because um, I think it's absolutely you need to provide the right coaching and pro, uh, you know, both virtual and in person. So, so they've got the skills to be able to do it. 
um, provide the right diagnostics and digital tools for the front line so that they can we can task shift to the community health workers, enable them to do everything that they can do at the front line. But actually, mindset is absolutely critical. Um, one of the things that you know we found is that there can be reticence about digital health. I'll go back to that stat I used earlier around you know over fifty percent had not used mobile health before. So there's there's often at the beginning a kind of nervousness, and so this attitudinal change is really important, which comes from community leaders and role modelling. It comes from identifying the advocates uh, in the community health teams and in the in the members of the communities. Um, but it also comes not in a classroom, it comes from delivering the value in practice. Um, when you can start to see as a community health worker or a community agent that we've trained up, actually, that it, it's made your life a lot simpler because actually you don't have all the paper to deal with. You can capture it onto your mobile and then connect it into the public health providers. Um, and you feel more confident and competent to be able to do to do your job because you actually have the tools you need um, that's what builds this change and enables things to be embedded across a broader group of health workers and, and people across the communities. Very much linked to that is this second point around, it's, it's mobile resources, it's not just courses. Um, clearly, you know, in-person sessions and the you know, more classroom-based stuff has a role, but actually from what we see and from talking to community health workers, what they want is they want stuff for the front line where they're actually doing the job at that point of need. And that's the resources on the mobile, it's a checklist, it's little videos, it's tools that they can capture to help with diagnoses and refer things on to different parts of the health system. So the kind of key point here is it's about learning for experience and, and making and supporting them to do that. Don't just provide a training session and leave it there. You've got to really be connecting with them on an ongoing basis to really support in terms of using these new digital tools to deliver impact. And then uh, just to kind of as a, as a, as a final uh, part of the session just to, to share another example and a slightly different way the platform was being used um, which was a new digital health model for non-communicable diseases uh, in rural populations where um, we'd identified there was really a need um, to provide an integrated solution of better understanding and education and coaching for non-communicable diseases in this case diabetes and hypertension um, to ensure that we address some of the gaps in screening and diagnostics, because it's often one of the weakest areas of the patient journey where we work. Um, but also it needs to involve access to the actual medicines, the affordable medicines that they need. And so what we did, what we did in, in, through the platform, and we talk about collaboration, um, is really bring together partners to be able to do that. So we partnered with um, Medtronic Labs, which is another social enterprise like us. They'd already done something uh, similar in India. And they had a lot of the coaching and education materials. So we worked with them to adapt the model and the materials for this program. Um, we worked with the public health nurses and the barangay, the community health workers in the Philippines, to equip them with the tools they needed for um, providing the screening and the coaching through monthly and fortnightly sessions. But then critically, we also then use the e-commerce part of the platform um, to train up members of the communities, just people from the communities, as in informal in healthcare providers who would go to the, out, out to people in their communities, process orders, and then deliver those through our pharmacy partners um, on, a, on a fortnightly basis into, into the villages. And so I think this idea of really integrating together different parts of the system is absolutely critical. Um, and we've seen that we've got really high enrollment on a patient pay service here. Um, and we're now looking to scale this up um, based on also impressive clinical outcomes we were able to achieve. And I guess um, what this reflects, so we talk about being community le led is, and I'm sure this may come up again in some of the sessions, the, the value of community trust in terms of driving the adoption of digital health solutions. So this involved pretty much everyone from the community and people trust the communities. Um, hence, you know, uh, obviously mothers to mothers have been doing such great work in this area for many years and, and use this as I'm sure as a key principle of success the trust comes from the communities and it drives the adoption of the digital health services and different solutions and to be honest I've been mean, sharing things that maybe we could have done better it was probably involving even more people in the solution I think one of the things we found trying to get residents and, and the members who joined up to use the digital resources at home it was it didn't work so well and we're, what we've identified is actually we could involve the families and the caregivers who are actually a bit more tech savvy than maybe some of our older older members there's a real opportunity to also drive better uses of digital resources that support patients at home as well so um 
yeah, that's that's really uh, my my learnings and and kind of the work we're doing and what we believe is needed to address this big gap. And um, I think you know, digital health can absolutely play such a pivotal role in health for all, universal health coverage. Um, but we need to recognise some of these realities um, for billions on the planet, and um, build digital health systems that reach everyone with the services they need. And as, as I'll come back to my, my three C's to finish off. So yeah, being community led, focusing on connectivity and, and bringing together collaborations in a way that we've, we've not done before. Uh, so Dave, thank you for that. And back to you, Nakuli. Rich, thank you so much for your remarks and insight. We've come to that time when we have to introduce our guest of honor. So honorable ministers, frontline health workers, presidents, CEOs, and other organizational leads and representatives, esteemed speakers, members of the Shapers Council for today's event, honored guests, and may I be allowed to say all protocols observed. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce the guest of honor for today, the Honorable Dr. Jane Ruth Aseng Osero, the Minister of Health for the Republic of Uganda. Dr. Aseng holds a bachelor's degree in medicine a master's in public health and a diploma in health system strengthening. She's a pediatric expert currently at the level of senior consultant in pediatrics. She is also a public health expert. She has vast experience both as a manager and practicing medical personnel, which she accumulated while serving in various capacities as medical officer, senior medical officer, medical officer special grade, medical superintendent, consultant pediatrician, senior consultant pediatrician, and hospital director. Prior to assuming her role, she served as director health, director general of health services, where she was responsible for coordinating technical functions for the delivery of health services. As minister of health, she possesses the constitutional powers and functions of spearheading the ministry. Among them are administration, policy formation, and direction. She is also responsible for defending the ministerial budget and issues orders and statutory regulations on the sector. In addition, she initiates and presents to cabinet the ministry's memorandums and accounts for the state, operations, functions, and achievements of the health sector. Honorable minister, we are truly delighted to have you with us here today to share your insights. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, allow me first of all to ask whether I can be heard. Yes, you can. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much, um, honorable ministers and uh, uh, all of you in your respective capacities and uh, allow me to thank all of you for your thoughts, mothers to mothers, of this virtual event, a meeting with clear intentions to recognize the remarkable potential of integrating the digital and the personal for, personnel for universal health coverage and contribute to the conversation as to how best to unlock this potential. I would also like to recognize that many in attendance today are community health workers or stakeholders working in support of this cadre of health workers. We recognize and salute community health workers for the critical role they play at all times, and especially during the past two years as we have battled COVID-19. And up to now, as we are still battling COVID-19 and ramping up vaccination. Allow me to turn my attention to the topic of my remarks, the role digital health technologies can play on the journey to universal health coverage. According to the World Health Organization, Digital Health Strategy 2020 to 2025, digital health technologies have the potential to improve health for everyone, everywhere, by accelerating the development and adoption of appropriate accessible, affordable, scalable, and sustainable person-centric digital health solutions to prevent, detect, and respond to epidemics and pandemics. 
therefore harnessing the potential of digital health technologies to achieve the 2030 agenda for sustainable development and the African agenda 2063 would accelerate progress across the health-related sustainable development goals. From our own experience in Uganda, we know that digital health technologies alone are not a magic one to address our health challenges here at home and across the African continent. Rather, they can be seen as an important ingredient in a bigger recycle with great potential to accelerate universal health coverage. In Uganda, we face several similar healthcare access challenges to other African countries. And we are keen to strengthen our health systems by further applying digital health technologies for consumers, health professionals, healthcare providers, and others towards empowering patients and achieving universal health coverage. I'll now talk about digital health and COVID-19. The need to harness this potential has never been greater. Even before COVID-19 struck, Uganda, like many other nations, faced challenges to ensuring access to quality health care for our growing population. With these challenges especially acutely felt by those in the last mile. COVID made many of these challenges even more pronounced. Of course, the disruption to in-person services caused by necessary lockdowns and infection control measures thrust digital tools even further into the spotlight. These lockdowns affected their accessibility to medical services in a setting where the healthcare system cannot handle most public health needs outside hospital premises. We are proud of the way Uganda responded to these challenges. The use of telehealth modalities, including teleconsultation, telepsychiatry, call centers, mobile phone health information dissemination increased. The telehealth services included remote teleconsultations via voice, chat, and video platforms, SMS reminders on facility appointments, and mobile SMS health information dissemination and awareness for behavioral change. Government partnered with WhatsApp to launch a chat box with information about COVID-19 and also partnered with Facebook to ensure accurate information was easily accessible to users. Some of the other digital solutions were applied at the airport for tracking of inbound passengers and also tracking uh, positive cases when they were identified. Indeed, some of the innovations we saw in Uganda of late was driven by participants in this meeting today, and we are extremely grateful. Using an innovative online training system, BRAC was able to train 4,180 community health workers and 300 village health teams to ensure they could continue to meet the demands of the communities they serve despite the COVID-19 lockdowns. Meanwhile, Mothers to Mothers, the conveners of today's events, rapidly trained their team of community health workers to deliver services by phone, and even launched a WhatsApp chat box in four languages with information on HIV, maternal health, and many other areas. Mothers to Mothers, and the government also teamed up to ensure delivery of vital medications at home could take place for people living with HIV in hard to reach areas of the East Central region. Regarding the way forward, what is striking about the innovations that I have shared above is that they combine digital tools and techniques with deep knowledge of and collaboration with communities and health workers. 
As we seek to use digital technologies to advance universal health coverage, we aim to continue on this path to use the technological advances to respond to the true health needs of our citizens and in partnership with the health workers at the front line. It is extremely important to apply these digital solutions even as we ramp up vaccination because we need the data for further planning and to ensure that we reach everyone who is eligible for vaccination. I thank you for your kind attention and I wish you a successful and a very enriching day further. Thank you very much for listening to me and thank you for giving me this great opportunity. I am sorry that I have my mask on and I do request that you forgive me because I am trying as much as possible to protect myself. God bless you. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for taking your time from your busy schedule. No apologies. We know you're in the field doing great work. So you have taken time from your busy schedule to share your remarks. And I know I speak for all of us here today when I say I'm inspired and informed by what you have shared, most notably saying digital health is an important ingredient in quality of healthcare and reaching the last mile. We look forward to further partnerships and collaboration to achieve our shared aims. We will move over to our final session, and this will be delivered by my colleague, Anne Marjorie Mbule. Um, and Marjorie is M2M's global technical lead and supports technical design, program integrity, and innovation working under Mothers to Mothers Director of Programs and Technical Support. Marjorie has 15 years of experience in design, management, and QAQI for integrated programs in areas of maternal, child health, nutrition, HIV and AIDS, and other chronic illnesses. Also in water and in sanitation and health, which are WASH programs, household economic strengthening, and now tailoring programs during global pandemics like COVID. Marjorie, over to you. Thank you so much, Nakulo. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marjorie Mbole, uh, like Nakulu introduced me. I'm honored today to be sharing with you M2M's efforts and experiences towards creating equitable health for all through digital technologies. When contextualizing this presentation, it will be impossible to do so without mentioning COVID-19, which continues to have a profound impact on all of us. And in the areas of maternal and child health, sexual and reproductive health, HIV, TB, malaria care, COVID continues to have catastrophic impacts on healthcare systems. And for the most marginalized and vulnerable people, the far reaching outcomes of COVID-19 have yet to be fully understood and determined. However, it has also been as part to accelerate our digital impacts and has given us lessons and questions we're we taking forward on the journey towards universal health coverage, which I'll share throughout this presentation. As Frank shared earlier, M2M started as a single support group in Cape Town, South Africa, and has grown her reach and scale since then. Our model is peer-based with women from the local communities trained and employed as community health workers. Our programs have expanded beyond our initial focus on prevention of mother to child, transmission of HIV to include the areas you see in the bullet points on the left. This work is implemented both through direct service delivery, technical assistance, uh, capacity building, and health system strengthening where applicable. What you see in the infographic on the right is M2M's integrated service platform that is central to our direct service delivery work. We will be unpacking this in the rest of my presentation, looking at how we are blending digital and in-person services. Looking at this graphic anti-clockwise, starting top left, the integrated service platform involves facility-based peer-led one-on-one and group services, community-based peer-led household and group services, and integrated outreaches to existing group, uh, community groups, hard to reach areas and surrounding schools. It is against this backbone of face-to-face -face service that M2M's e-services, namely peer via phone and the virtual mental mother platform were developed in 2020. Let's take a look at 
how they came about and the progress we have made. When COVID hit, M2M adopted the three priorities you see on this slide. As the virus spread and lockdowns and other restrictions came into play, we needed to act quickly to continue to provide optimal service to our clients and meet their ongoing and new health needs. Even though our frontline staff had been declared as essential workers and so could continue to provide in-person services, we were keenly aware that our digital platform was the key to providing services during these unprecedented times. With our country teams, we rapidly developed a portfolio of e-services with two pillars that we call peer via phone and the virtual mentor mother platform, which I'll explain in detail on the next slide. To ensure the safe integration with in-person in services, we created and embedded a comprehensive COVID-19 crisis and program management toolkit that outlines modifications to M2M standard service delivery in health facilities and communities. We also reallocated budgets to secure personal protective equipment and rapidly undertook health assessments of all our staff, removing particularly vulnerable staff from frontline duties. We're not scared of failing. We took a fail fast and succeed sooner approach as we designed and rolled out all these critical priorities. Since inception, M2M has predominantly provided peer-led face-to-face services through one-on-one -on -one and group sessions at health facilities, communities, and households. Because of our mentor mothers, um, and because they were declared as essential health workers, were able to continue face-to-face -face service delivery. You'll see these in green at the top of the slide. And in 2020, we modified our country and World Health Organization guidelines res respecting social distancing, minimizing large group gathering, and so on. We also started to implement the two e-services, as you'll see on the right-hand side of the slide. We will now watch a video speaking to these e-services. During COVID-19, we pivoted to use our digital diary as a service delivery tool. Instead of preparing for face-to-face -face appointments, we used it to deliver services by phone. We created scripted and structured calls with our clients with the frequency changed depending on the risk profile to make sure we kept people in care and adherent during COVID-19 while also delivering COVID-19 education and information. We also developed a chatbot on WhatsApp that we call the Virtual Mentor Mother Platform or VMMP. The VMMP augments and improves our existing service range. It is an on-demand tool that allows clients to access health information they need from a trusted source when they want it. It is in a format that can easily be shared with friends and family. This type of tool is very useful for adolescents. In phase one, we translated COVID-19 content from the World Health Organization into almost 30 languages and rolled this out in nine countries. In phase two, we added content on wider health areas such as HIV prevention and treatment, maternal health, and early childhood development. This project, already in the works prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, will take Mothers to Mothers further on its journey for technology-enabled service delivery to ensure universal health coverage for as many clients as possible. I also wanted to add that a help desk staffed by a nurse is provided to answer complex queries that the board can't and to refer people to M2M in service services, in person services where relevant and available. The chatbot is not only available to clients, but we also have a dedicated line for our frontline workers, which I'll talk more about a bit later. Let's now take a look at what the data shows. 
On this slide, you will see some rich numbers. The proportion of this total reach driven by peer via phone services is much higher as these services can be provided by our team to anyone with any phone via voice. A smartphone is not required. We have positive user feedback on the VMMP, but large subsections of our clients report challenges to consistent use. Economic pressures from COVID mean we see continued deprioritization of purchase of data among clients. Smartphones have also become disposable assets to prioritize other urgent needs like food and healthcare. To mitigate this, we have created mobile hotspots at facilities and in communities and continue to try to increase our work in household economic strengthening. We are also actively seeking creation of strategic partnerships with private telecommunication companies, investment agencies, and others to reduce these structural barriers. Moving on to, show, to showing some data of the e-services, starting with the virtual mentor mother platform, VMMP, this is the WhatsApp chatbot. A few months ago, we took a deep dive into how the content was being used by both clients and M2M field teams, analyzing nearly 300,000 interactions across both lines. The top graph shows the interactions on the client line. The living with HIV section was the most popular, attracting 33% of user interactions on the platform. The general section, attracting 28% of the users, has information about M2M, the VMMP service, and guides on changing language on the platform and on navigating the platform. The healthy pregnancy and motherhood section also received significant interactions as did the help desk. We received a lot of questions about pregnancy, ailments during pregnancy, breastfeeding strategies and alternatives. As I mentioned, we are also trying to use this tool to improve our own health workers experience and knowledge. Content on COVID-19 was most popular on the team line. This has remained a key source of COVID-19 information and related service protocols for M2M staff. Clients and other users seem to have relied on other sources of COVID-19 information. We're learning from our users what content needs expanding or adding and are doing this frequently. Active client follow-up, ACFU, is one of the priority peer via phone calls for clients who miss any, any key clinical appointments. This is especially important during COVID as we are concerned about people defaulting on HIV treatment or missing other clinical services due to fear or misinformation. The call aims to encourage the clients to return to care and recommit to attend healthcare for themselves or their child regularly. The mentor mother will understand why the client has defaulted during the call and together with the client identify possible solutions. Ideally, the most suitable will be agreed upon and implemented by the clients. We sampled 18,155 clients who had agreed to be actively followed up when they had missed an appointment to understand the impact of this intervention. 10,563, which is a total of 58% clients had consented to phone-based active client follow-up and were indeed contacted on phone. Out of these, 88%, a total of 9,334 were successfully reached. Of those reached, 80%, a total of 8,470 returned to the health facility and received the missed clinical services after the call. This excellent result shows that peer via phone e-services were well accepted by clients and supported M2M's exemplary retention care rates during the COVID-19 period in 2020. However, this was not without challenges. Qualitative feedback on challenges include clients who reported that they could not speak on the phone because they were sharing the phone with partners or with the parents. Clients relocated due to COVID restrictions and could not access services in MTM supported sites. Some clients could not be reached at all. The phone calls were not answered or the phone numbers were no longer valid. This information has been used by country teams to design strategies to improve support for these clients. Despite COVID-19, M2M's performance remained exemplary during 2020. We improved or maintained our performance on key indicators, 
And here is just one example. In this graphic, we show a two-year trend of client retention in care on antiretroviral therapy at three-month intervals. What you will note is that through a hybrid model that delivers face-to-face -face services, highly complemented by phone-based support and WhatsApp chatbot, M2M is maintaining retention in care of greater than 90% at 12 months, even with the impact of COVID-19 in 2020. We now will quickly go over the lessons learned thus far. This white cloud shows you some of the key factors we addressed when we updated our operating procedures based on staff and client feedback. We have learned that remote service delivery work best when supported by excellent personal skills. This means front, uh, training of frontline workers in softer skills is key. We use this learning to update our standard operating procedures, the SOPs, and roll these out with the team. For the calls to clients, these SOPs included telephone etiquette, for instance, how to ensure clear and effective communication with your client by not talking over them, by being patient, asking questions, knowing what to do if the client becomes upset, and so on. We also advise on very practical issues, such as uh, scheduling of the calls, where to locate yourself while making calls, how to take notes, how to monitor use of your airtime. Very importantly, we continuously reminded our field staff that confidentiality remains key. To conclude, we would like to leave you with some tech home messages, which we believe are critical to unlocking the potential of digital health tools to achieve universal health coverage. Digital technology is a critical tool to optimize client-oriented service delivery but it's not a silver bullet. It needs to be thoughtfully integrated with in-person services. It needs, to, it needs a strong systems foundation to function optimally. Bigger structure barriers to uptake and impact like cost of data literacy need new partnerships and shared vision to overcome. Meaningful engagement with communities and health workers is critical to success. And last but not least, ongoing supportive supervision, training, and capacity building is a must. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie, for your presentation. Skills is key. We use this learning to update our standard operating procedures, the SOPs, and roll these out with the team. For the calls to clients, these SOPs included telephone etiquette, for instance, how to ensure clear and effective communication with your client by not talking over them, by being patient, asking questions, knowing what to do if the client becomes upset, and so on. We also advise on very practical issues, such as uh, scheduling of the calls, where to locate yourself while making calls, how to take notes, how to monitor use of your airtime. Very importantly, we continuously reminded our field staff that confidentiality remains key. To conclude, we'd like to leave you with some tech home messages, which we believe are critical to unlocking the potential of digital health tools to achieve universal health coverage. Digital technology is a critical tool to optimize client-oriented service delivery, but it's not a silver bullet. It needs to be thoughtfully integrated with in-person services. It needs, to, it needs a strong systems foundation to function optimally. Bigger structure barriers to uptake and impact, like cost of data literacy, need new partnerships and shared vision to overcome. Meaningful engagement with communities and health workers is critical to success. And last but not least, ongoing supportive supervision, training, and capacity building is a must. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie, for your presentation. Um, and now we will go into a shortened version of uh, the Q&A uh, session. Please, we would love to um, invite questions. If you can raise your hand to the panelists, also feel free to post your question in the chat box for us to review. Uh, as of now, what we'll do, we'll go straight into asking the panelists uh, one of the last questions before we, we send them over to, uh, before we have the next session. So with having so many policymakers and donors in attendance today, 
if you could choose a, a key take home message for them, what would that be? Maybe we can start with uh, Upile. Sure, thanks so much. So I think a key take home message would be, you know, there's a call for action for policymakers, donors and others to prioritize investments in digital health tools like the Health Center by Phone Solution, which helps to improve access to healthcare services as well as enhance care and coordination, as well as integration, and most importantly, supporting critical decision-making processes that would then enable the, um, the you know, prioritization of investments in various digital health um, um, solutions as a way of achieving sustainable pathways to achieving universal health coverage. So making sure that there is that buy-in and support in supporting investments and coordination, I believe is one critical element that would help us get to where we desire in order to you know, achieve universal health um, care um, coverage. Thanks so much, Upile. Rich, uh, your end, please also include the response for the question that you have. Um, there's a question that was posted to you. Um, so if you could also include that in your in your discussion and close your remarks. Yeah, sure, Nikki. Um, so if I maybe do the, do the question first. So there was, there was a question, I think, around low resource settings, limited resources. How do you how do you manage that? Um, obviously, uh, we're trying to create a very sustainable solution through what we're doing, um, but clearly funding is is needed to enable to establish those services, uh, catalyze change, and we're grateful to the funders and the partners that work with us to do it. However, I think the other way we can look at it is where you have limited resources, it also drives innovation. And I think that's what's needed. Um, inventive solutions to some of the health system challenges. And I guess that's where I'm coming for with, you know, make it community led um, task shift to members of the communities that also develops the uh, the, the communities in terms of economically as well, um, give them digital tools that actually work and can connect the system um, that can provide a lower cost, more efficient and more effective ways to deliver care and then bring together collaborators from across the system. Don't try and all do the same thing. Pull your resources together and your capabilities. So I, so I think that would be my response to that, that question. Um, in terms of, uh, Nikhila, your question around the pol policymakers and funders, I'll try and keep it very, very, very concise because I know uh, we're a little over time. Um, yeah. Very clearly, though, we're all passionate about delivering health for all, and we, I think, we all agree that digital help is a, uh, or I hope we are, is, is it can be a key accelerator to do it. So my key message is that conventional health systems won't accelerate health for all for everyone on the planet. Conventional digital health services won't achieve it either. Uh, there needs to be more focus and action on the digital health systems and services that work for the billions on the planet in low connectivity, low resource settings. And if we do that and we do that together, we can truly deliver on health for all. Great, thanks, Rich. Marjorie, from you. I think for me is that if we are to achieve universal health coverage in context of a prolonged global pandemic, uh, digital solutions are not an option. They are obligatory. And uh, as we um, enhance our policy guidelines, this is something that um, a hybrid model or integration of these uh, among the work of the, the role of the uh, community health care workers, even the professional health care workers, remains pertinent if we are to achieve a UHC by 2030. Thank you. Thank you so much. And all too quickly, this session has come to an end. Many thanks again to our on, to our guest of uh, honor, the Honorable Minister, and to our presenters, Rich, Marjorie, Upile. Uh, I'm now delighted to hand you back over to our MC, uh, Shombi Ellis. Thank you so much, Nakulu, for uh, such a skillful moderation of that session. Um, so many insights coming out, um, a lot of comments in the chat um, about different digital health solutions that are happening within the context of Africa. Please, for the new um, attendees, welcome. If you'd like to tweet about the event, um, use the hashtag, hashtag M2M Digital Health. Um, and we'd like to thank once again our guest of honor, the Honorable Dr. Jane uh, Ruth Cheng, Minister of Health for Uganda, for sharing her insights and joining us. And thank you once again to Marjorie Upile and Rich for your very, very rich remarks. 
Um, as we begin the next session, it's only fair um, that we really take it back to the health worker. The next session is entitled Centering the Health Worker, Digital Health and Health Workers, and how do you balance patient and health worker needs? It only seems right that we should actually ask the frontline health workers to set the scene. So I'd like to now ask for your kind attention for a couple of minutes where we're going to um, really get a context um, of some of those insights um, across the African continent um, and experiences between the pros and the cons of M2M's digital health tools. Digital health tools have really helped me a lot because COVID-19 pandemic came with a lot of restrictions, one being social distancing and typically keeping away from crowds. So meeting my clients became a challenge. But with the introduction of the tools, I was able to ensure that my clients receive timely and efficient health services and education as well. One of the challenges that we are facing with digital health tools is that the internet is unstable and most of our clients have no money to buy bundles. We are unable to reach them on WhatsApp and other platforms when needed. Digital health tools have really helped me because I'm able to use them to follow my clients who have missed their appointments and bring them back to care. These tools also help me to reach the patients outside of the facility and offer them better health education. Thank you so much. And just some perspectives from our frontline health workers. It's great to be able to talk about the pros and the cons and really put it into context. We talk about digital health, we talk about using these tools, um, but it's not always um, as simple as we think. Um, when, when, when she said the internet is unstable, <laughs> I personally uh, definitely felt that one. 